On March 29th, several B-2 Spirits launched under cover of darkness and made a beeline right for the Middle East. With its whole host of stealth and combat capabilities on board, these aircraft aren't just dropping bombs, they're sending a message. And while you would be right to expect their targets were the Houthis, what you would not expect is how this mission ended. As the B-2s finished refueling to ensure they had enough gas to get over Yemen, the bombers entered a strictly controlled path like these on the screen. These paths are called restrictive operating zones and are a key component to ensure when those bombs drop, they don't accidentally land on top of friendly aircraft. If you've been following the campaign in Yemen, you'll know that the airspace above it is incredibly congested. U.S. Navy F-18s, Growlers, F-35s, Air Force F-15s, B-1s and B-52s, and the occasional Marine F-35 and Reaper drone means the airspace above Yemen looks like Los Angeles during rush hour traffic. To prevent their bombs from falling on top of friendly units, the B-2s must stay in their lanes, and everyone else has to stay far away. Otherwise, instead of making headlines for destroying a target, they'll make the news about a friendly fire incident. But thankfully, American air traffic controllers have diligently de-conflicted the airspace so the B-2s are free to rain hell. The first wave of strikes hit Sadaa government around 0200 local time. Ten targets went up in smoke, command centers, air defense batteries, and hardened comms bunkers. As these strikes were going on, the Truman's F-18s launched decoy strikes using GPS-guided bombs to poke the hornet's nest and get the Houthis moving. That's when the B-2s hit their next target. From an altitude of 50,000 feet, a pair of B-2s released several more GBU-31 JDAMs, 2,000-pound GPS-guided bombs that hid within 10 feet of their targets. The choice of JDAMs wasn't accidental. The facilities were reinforced but above ground, perfect for a GBU-31 to punch through concrete and explode inside. With its inertial navigation, even GPS jammers provided by the Iranians wouldn't do anything to them. This is because the Houthis couldn't even see them coming. Originally, America designed the B-2 for one purpose, to prevent a nuclear Armageddon. The B-2 Spirit is so well engineered, it can penetrate enemy defenses anywhere in the world, deliver devastating payloads, and get out of dodge before the enemy even knows what hit them. It can do this thanks to its four powerful General Electric F-18GE100 turbofan engines. Each of these engines can pump out 17,300 pounds of thrust, giving this massive bomber a combined total of 69,200 pounds of thrust at full power. With this, the B-2 can cruise at high subsonic speeds that top out around 630 miles per hour, but it can do so at a maximum elevation of 50,000 feet. That puts it well above the reach of most surface-to-air missile systems, including any the Houthis have in their inventory. But its stealth profile isn't just clever design. It's the result of science meshing with military precision perfectly. In aviation, the radar cross-section, or RCS, is how big an aircraft appears on the radar. The bigger the RCS, the more likely you are to be seen and shot down. For the bombers on this mission, their radar cross-sections are just 0.1 square meters, smaller than a bird. Compared to an F-15, it's about 250 times smaller. Its ability to obtain such a small RCS is primarily due to how it's shaped. If you look at this B-2 in flight, you'll find nothing but smooth, rounded edges. This allows the B-2 to bend radar energy away from the enemy's radars at 60 to 90 degree angles. Because radars need the energy to bounce back to get a return, the radar thinks there's nothing there when, in fact, the B-2 can be barreling right towards the radar. But smooth edges isn't the only tool to deflect enemy radar emissions. It's also something that completely surrounds it that can shield it from any Houthi radar. If you look at the B-2, you'll see that it's covered in black paint. While the black color certainly helps to camouflage it at night, it's what this paint is made up of that's the true secret sauce. For you see, this isn't the kind of paint you can just pick up at your local Sherwin-Williams. 
What covers the B2 skin is a mixture of highly classified composite materials with specialized iron ball paint. By having these two materials work in conjunction, the B2 absorbs up to 80% of enemy radar waves. So even if the Houthis could get a return on the B2, which they can't, the return would be so small that it looked like a bird or a cloud instead of the awesome weapon that it is. But even if Iran or Russia decided to gift the Houthis some of their best air search radars, it would not have helped this morning. The Houthi radar operators frantically searched the sky for them, they never even saw the B-2s coming. Even if they weren't distracted by the earlier attacks, their radars, likely Soviet-era P-18 Spoonrest or Iranian-supplied Qadir systems, are long-range radar systems that operate in what's called the L-band. The L-band of frequencies refers to radars that operate in the 1 to 2 gigahertz range. And while they're useful for helping the Houthi spot ships at sea, these systems are useless at spotting stealth aircraft like the B-2. It's like throwing a giant fishing net to catch a needle. Stealth aircraft just slip right through. This is because the B-2 is specifically designed to absorb up to 80% of that directed energy wavelength. And what it doesn't absorb, it scatters at oblique angles. This means Houthi gunners never even get a warning an aircraft was there until bombs start exploding in their positions. As the B-2 bombers were pummeling their additional targets, the next wave of Truman's F-18s were inbound to help obliterate Houthi positions. U.S. Navy jets destroyed over a dozen targets around Sadat, including communication towers and broadcast stations that gave orders to Houthi units in the field. This time, the B-2s came in for the second pass and delivered a barrage of 500-pound GBU-38 JDAMs. With their blast radius of roughly 80 meters, this was about 10 times smaller than the 2,000-pound bombs they dropped earlier in the morning. However, this was ideal for taking out enemy infrastructure without causing significant collateral damage to civilian homes and businesses. As bombs fell, the B-2s banked away and continued onward toward their next target. Though the bombers had been raining hell all morning, the Houthis had yet to fire a single missile in response so far. The positions were gone before alarms even went off, and it was all thanks to this ingenious design feature. You remember those engines we talked about earlier? If you look at a jet like this, you can see its engine exhaust is producing a ton of heat. Because of this heat, super advanced radars can pick up the infrared signature off of it and potentially get enough fidelity to be accurate for a fire control solution. To prevent the enemy from getting a lock on its infrared emissions, the engineers used this novel idea to completely eliminate the B-2's IR footprint. If you look at this cutout, you'll see the designers actually embedded the engines deep within the aircraft's body. When the engines are online, the B-2 channels its exhaust through specially shaped ducts that diffuse it before it exits. As a result, this reduces the IR signature of the B-2 to just 20% of that of a conventional jet. But even if the enemy could get a lock on the B-2, it wouldn't last very long, thanks to these defense measures. Later that morning, the B-2s offloaded the rest of their presence at eight more sites in the Amran government. This time, the B-2s coordinated closely with the Navy E-2D Hawkeyes, using a shared tactical data link to maintain a three-dimensional airspace picture without ever emitting active radar themselves. The weapons of choice here were again GBU-31 JDAMs, but possibly modified with penetrator warheads. Why? Intelligence suggested these were underground data centers, buried bunkers masquerading as civilian infrastructure. The bombs dropped from 50,000 feet and were free-falling for over 40 seconds before detonation. By the time the ground shook, the bombers were already 50 miles outbound. The F-18s never got close. That was by design. The airspace was tightly deconflicted. The B-2s flew in at a steady altitude and speed while Truman's fighters maintained no-fly bubbles 30 miles wide around the target area. At no point were friendly aircraft in danger. This was a synchronized dance, and they landed it with perfect rhythm due to this secret technology. 
Though you can't see it in this photograph, there are actually laser warning receivers and radar warning receivers that completely line the aircraft's skin. These give the B-2 360-degree situational awareness without having to actively emit any radiation the enemy could pick up. In addition to these passive defense measures, the B-2 is fully networked into U.S. combat command and control. It can receive in-flight target updates via satellite links, relay mission data through secure UHF, VHF, and HF channels, and tap into the Link-16 technical data link networks while in flight. It also has a highly classified defensive system that monitors electromagnetic activity across the spectrum. If an enemy radar locks on, the system alerts the crew and suggests evasive action. Whether that means shifting altitude, changing heading, or rerouting around enemy air search corridors. And what's even worse for the Houthis is that these beasts still have a lot of hurt left to give. Inside its internal bomb bay, each B-2 can carry up to 40,000 pounds of ordnance loaded into two bomb bays beneath the fuselage. Its potential payloads can include up to 16 2,000-pound JDAMs, 80 500-pound MK-82s, or one 30,000-pound GBU-57 massive ordnance penetrator. In addition to conventional weapons, the B-2 can deploy either the B-61 or B-83 variable-yield gravity bombs. But thankfully for the Houthis, the war has not gone nuclear yet. But for now, this is as close to the nuclear option as the Trump administration has without actually crossing that red line. The B-2 bombers finish hitting their secondary targets with what ordnance they have left inside. With their bomb base now empty, the B-2s knew it was time to head back to base. But instead of turning back around and going back the way they came, the bombers banked right and headed straight for the middle of the Indian Ocean. But what the heck were those two massive bombers going to do in the middle of nowhere? Located here, about 4,000 kilometers southeast of Yemen is a secret military base called Diego Garcia and has been a mainstay of American power for over 50 years that rarely makes the news. Because of its isolated location, it's perfect to keep any prying eyes away from ship or aircraft departures in a timely fashion but it doesn't stop all of them. In the days following the March 29 strikes, satellite imagery and aircraft spotters began reporting unusual activity. B-2 spirits taxiing on runways far from their home base at Whitman Air Force Base in Missouri. Though these reports are unconfirmed by the Pentagon at the time this video was made, the satellite photo clearly shows six B-2s on the island. This proves the war just changed course. Diego Garcia isn't just any base. It's a forward-deployed, deep-range launch pad designed for long-duration strike campaigns. Located roughly 3,000 kilometers from Yemen, it sits within striking distance of the Middle East, East Africa, and parts of Asia. From here, it takes a B-2 bomber roughly 5.5 hours to get to Yemen. By comparison, flying from Missouri to the Middle East is 12 hours one way. That means a standard long-range mission from Missouri will take about 24 hours and involve at least four aerial refuelings, since the bombers refuel every six hours in the air. However, Diego Garcia is not a temporary base. With its 12,000-foot runway and hardened shelters, it can support the complete B-2 mission requirements for months at a time. If several B-2s really have moved forward, even temporarily, it means the Pentagon is preparing for sustained precision strikes and not just one-off operations. That means more flexibility, higher sortie rates, and less crew fatigue. It also means the U.S. can launch on shorter notice, respond faster to emerging threats, and sustain an op-tempo that constrains enemy decision cycles. Politically, basing B-2s on Diego Garcia signals seriousness. The U.S. rarely forward deploys strategic bombers unless the situation is volatile enough to warrant a show of overwhelming force. Doing so without fanfare, without a press release or media coverage, sends an even clearer message. We're already in position and we're not waiting for you to escalate. To the Houthis, it means their infrastructure can be erased at any moment. To Iran, 
It's a reminder that regional destabilization has strategic costs. And to allies in the region, it shows that the U.S. isn't just flexing power, it's committing it with stealth, speed, and surgical accuracy. If the B-2s are now forward deployed to Diego Garcia, even part-time, the conflict just moved into a new phase. One where response time is measured in hours, not days. And where America's enemies no longer have the luxury of guessing when the next strike will come. Bye for now.